Well, welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about our guest, Jonathan Fields, in the house. Good to see you, man. Yeah. We are in your hotel room here in Portland, we are. and um, we're both at a, a conference called World Domination Summit with Chris Gillibu, a friend of ours who you actually introduced me to a few years ago, and um, having fun, man. It's been a while since I've seen you. It's been I know, and you're on the tail end of, uh, the Olympics. of a whole, whole bunch of traveling yes, right now. Yes, Rio Olympics, like and it's been crazy, but uh, you've got a book coming out called How to Live a Good Life, Soulful Stories, Surprising Science, and Practical Wisdom by Jonathan Fields, and uh, it's coming out right now, so I want to make sure everyone can go pick up a copy. It's an awesome book. And why uh, Why this book? Why How to Live a Good Life? I actually remember yeah. uh, you know, talking to you when you came up with this like four years ago, I think, yep. this whole brand yep. with first a video series, a website, camp, yeah. events, now the book. Why? Why did you want to go into this direction where before you were – um, doing some other work. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's sort of like this this evolution where, th- so the book I wrote before this, it's been almost five years since yeah. I had a book out and that book was called Uncertainty and it, it won a fairly that prestigious- five years ago? Dude, yeah, it's like wow. that long ago. crazy. So it, so it came out, it was, I, I was proud of it, it did well and it, it won this interesting award from 800 CEO Read which was, um, it, it was named the best personal development book of the year that came out, and I had this really weird response to it because on the one hand I'm like, this mm-hmm. is this is awesome, it's a, it's a really nice honor, yeah. and on the other hand I'm like, oh, I'm not a personal development guy, <laughs> right, you know, right. like I'm about entrepreneurship and all yes. this stuff, and it's interesting because I had this conversation with a couple of people who know me really well, and they're like, no, but you are that person, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and you need to actually start stepping into it and owning the fact that fundamentally what you are about is exploring and examining human potential, like yeah. how we actually live on the planet and get a lot of good stuff out of our time here. And what I've come to realize over those probably four years or so is that I, I am deeply fascinated in entrepreneurship and the world of business building. And but um, and this is kind of a more recent sort of realization for me is that my deeper interest is in how like entrepreneurship, for example, uh, it's really cool to help people bring things to life. I know mm-hmm. you do a lot of this too, right? But what's actually even more interesting to me is how, like the 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 process of entrepreneurship, the gauntlet of entrepreneurship changes the entrepreneur. You know, it's this amazing canvas for the development of human potential. And what I start to realize about myself is that that's actually probably the deeper fascination for me. Mm. And I've kind of been saying, well, you know, couching it in terms of entrepreneurship and business right. because it's like, it's a way that I feel like I can legitimize myself yeah. um, rather than just saying actually fundamentally I'm about exploring deeply the human condition and how yeah. we live better in the world. I'm like, you know what? At a certain time, um, you just got to step into who you are. So it's not, I'm not walking away from that side of myself. But it was kind of like it's time to stand in the fact that this is actually an essential part of who I am. Mm-hmm. And we've been, you know, so Good Life Project emerged as not just a media company, but it was an attempt for me to go out and find these teachers who embodied elements of really living a good life yeah. and then sit down with them and learn from them. You know, so over the years, it's and similar to what you do, right, with sort of like people around performance and expertise yeah. and mastery. You know, for me, it was like this broader exploration of what are the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and and it was really, it was kind of like it was time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, 15, was it 15 years ago you opened a yoga, yoga studio, right? Yeah. The it was day two, before or day after 9-11? Or? 2001, I signed the lease for a floor in a building in New York City um, the day before 9-11. Oh, crazy. Yeah. I mean, married, had a, had a new home, a three-month-old baby, um, and I... I committed to literally like a six year lease for a Florida building in Hell's Kitchen, New York City and woke up the next before morning. Before nine eleven, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Literally the day before nine eleven. Life is good, everything's right. smooth. I'm, I'm in about New York. to do this incredible thing, right? <laughs> and build what I hope would be sort of the premier yoga center. Uh-huh. In before New York yoga City. was getting yeah. Super popular. Yeah. And this was like, you know, there were nuggets of it and there were definitely a handful of great studios around the city, but I wanted to sort of take things to a different level. I came out of the world of business before that. So I was looking at this from a different lens. And this uh, was pre Lululemon. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, none of that stuff existed. Yoga works. Yeah. What I knew was back then, most people like yoga, I I had been practicing yoga and I knew that it can make a really big difference. But you ask your average sort of person who came from my background out of like, you know, in the middle years, you know, like unfit, sedentary, 
unflexible and kind of like hesitant about all things woo woo mm-hmm. to go to like the average yoga studio that was around then. Yeah. And, you know, so you take, like, a 40-something-year-old dude who walks in, like, okay, step number one, take off your shoes. Step number two, you know, sort of, like, get... It's in prayer mode or something, right? Right, yeah. you know, like, and you're, you're very often surrounded by incense, yes. you know, so it's Candles, a little bit weird. And, yeah. and then you're, there's, there'd be a whole bunch of chanting and a, a Dharma talk in class. And it was, it was terrifying for a lot of people. And I came to love that myself, mm-hmm. but I also knew that... Most it it pushed away so many people. So the yeah. idea with that was like, can we preserve the power of the practice, and build a community and a company that per, that that lowered barrier to participation, so that anybody could walk in the doors, and actually feel really like like I'm okay here. Yeah. I mean, and we went to the level of even, you know, a lot of our students were, are are women, and still in the yoga mm. world, the, the vast majority of people who practice and go to studios are, are women. And I know that women tend to suffer a much higher level of scent triggered migraines. So one of the things we did was actually we didn't have incense because I want mm-hmm. even like on those like any any way I could remove a barrier to somebody coming, you know, we went there. But that was kind of like my first foray into business meets lifestyle slash movement slash or like my my that deeper interest in like how do we develop the person? How do we develop a, a better life? Yeah. How do we have a good life? Or yeah. you know. And you did that at the perfect time, it sounds like, with 9-11, right? Well, yeah, I mean, yes yes and no. Like, looking back, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I woke up the next morning, like everybody else who's a you know, long-time New Yorker, mm-hmm. I was horrified, and, and, you know, we lost somebody that day as well. Wow. Um, and uh, But there was a moment that happened after that where, you know, so we literally, I, and I remember this so clearly, we, we, it's my wife, uh, me, and a three-month-old baby, a little like, car seat, Jumped in a car, drove up to the house of um, you know, the person who we knew was actually working on the top floor of one of the towers, and we're all kind of like you know holding vigil at his wife's house, who's you know also wow. a friend of ours, and there were a whole bunch of people. At the end of that day, you know, nobody really knew what was going to happen, who was going to come home. Everybody left, and it was just uh, my wife, my my kid, and her, and. And um, and they went up to put one of the kids to sleep. They had two little kids, a nine-month-old and a two-and-a-half-year-old. And they asked me if I would go upstairs and, and read to the two-and-a-half-year-old. Mm. And I can remember walking up the stairs and just opening the kid's door. And here's this two-and-a-half-year-old boy sitting in bed, you know, like half-tucked with a book on his lap. You know, and in the back of my mind, I'm starting to get the idea that his dad is never coming home. It's that night, And, like, yeah. my job just that night is just to spend a few minutes, like, reading this way. He has no idea who I am. Right. To just try and make something somewhat okay for these like few moments before he goes to bed that night. Wow. Knowing that the rest of his life was going to be really different. And driving home from there, I was like, you know, I'd have a decision to make. You know, this is a terrifying time. You know, am I going to launch a business into a sea of pain? Um, and, you know, potentially put my family at risk. But the flip side was, man, my, my friend didn't go to work that morning expecting not to come home. Mm-hmm. Like, we got one pass through. And and if I was going to do it, the city was never more in need of a a business that was built around a community that was built around healing. Mm-hmm. You know, so we went forward with it, and eight weeks later, we opened this thing, and uh, you know, I had to change a lot of the way that we opened and launched, right. just to be super respectful. But flourished really, really quickly because we were serving this really deep need, and it was an amazing, amazing window in time to be in New York City serving um, a, a deep and profound healing need mm-hmm. um, when people are literally wandering around and a day is just trying to find people to be with where they could just find a little bit of stillness and a little bit of solace. So yeah, that wow. was sort of like one of the, it's th- probably very likely, you, know, like, you could probably trace the beginnings of this book sure. like, back to right around to that. that moment. Yeah. What were you doing before that? I was a lawyer in a past life. <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I came out of law school. I was the entrepreneur. Like, I was a lemonade stand kid, yeah. right? Like, you were the athlete. I was the lemonade sure. stand kid. And uh, But I made, like, this kind of, like, left turn and ended up going to law school. I was really fortunate, did well in law school, and had some great opportunity coming out. So I was in a big firm, you know, in doing New in New York City. Yeah. You know, great job, the power job, where, you know, wearing fancy suits doing huge deals is doing like mergers and acquisitions and security and um but even in that job there was a moment where i barely slept and barely came home for three mm. weeks and i ended up in emergency surgery because i literally I, my immune system basically cratered yeah. and an infection huge infection brewed in the middle of my body and ate a hole through my intestines from the outside in wow sent me into surgery i came out knock on wood everything was fine 
But you know, when your body rejects your career, yeah, at some yeah. point, it's you like, got to make a change. Yeah, you got to listen. And uh, did you change I, pretty quickly, or did you? It took me. I I I probably made the decision that, like, I knew at mm-hmm. that moment in time, I was like, all right, this is killing me. It's not working. Right. I stopped doing all the stuff that kept me okay, like my practice, my exercise, <laughs> all the stuff I love. Yeah. I wasn't doing it all. And at the same time, I looked down the road, and this was probably the bigger thing. And I was like, okay, all the people that have the job that supposedly I'm working towards, do I want that? Like, do, if I look at their lives, do I want More to live time that working, life? Yeah. And the answer was no. It was like a crystal clear no. And that was a moment where I was like, all right, there's, um, if I truly love this path, and I have friends that do and, mm-hmm. and are still in it, I would be like, all right, I'll figure out how to be okay and work this hard. Yeah. But I didn't. You know, so that was a moment where I was like, all right, I'm on my way out. But even then, it took me better part of a year to take that journey right. out because I had a lot invested in my journey to date and I had to kind of figure my next step. But my next step was making 12 bucks an hour as a personal trainer. Really? Yeah. So a personal <laughs> trainer before yoga. Yeah. So I, I like the first step out because I reconnected. I trained as a gymnast for the first huh. half of my life competitively and I love movement and exercise. Yeah. And, um, and I looked at Still do a backflip? No. <laughs> the trampoline. You probably baby. could, can you? Yeah. Yeah, I figured, right? I'm like, um, I'm like a springboard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I was, I wanted to, I wanted to go back and connect with that. And, you know, you blend mm-hmm. entrepreneurship with fitness and movement. And, um, and I want to, and I looked at the fitness industry and I started reading a lot of the data and started getting into like the industry research. And, you know, truth is it's relatively disastrous when you really understand mm-hmm. the business model. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an industry that where 80 to 85 percent of adults in the U.S. won't join or stay members of clubs and billions of dollars of marketing have been thrown at it over the years. And part of the challenge is because the fundamental model is designed in a way which maximizes revenue per square foot rather than actually serves the outcome driven and sort of like social needs of the mm. people who are in the facility. So, so my goal was like, let me figure out a better mousetrap. Let me figure out where the brakes are. So that's why I didn't want to start in, in management. I started as a personal trainer making 12 bucks an hour because I want to know what's happening. Understand like, it, yeah. On the, the most basic level, like where are the breakdowns, what's working, what's not. Then shortly after, I opened my first facility, which is like a, a small, it's like 5,000 square foot high-end training center. Huh. And uh, yeah, I don't even know if you know this like part of the part. story. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we grew that. Um, like a about, one-on-one personal training yeah, center. Yeah, yeah. So we grew that um, after about two and a half years, sold my stake in that company. I had a partner mm-hmm. in it to an investor group. And, um, but we were doing, in pretty short order, we were surrounded by like two massive gyms on either side. And we were crushing them from uh, like a, a training revenue standpoint. Right. In a month, we were doing more than the average big box gym was doing in a year. Wow. In terms of you know, like training revenue and stuff like that. And it was largely because my whole goal was just like, how do I serve and delight on a profound level? And how do I really understand the psychology of what people need mm. to get out of this? And a lot of it was built around community and deliverable outcomes um, rather than just locking people into long-term commitments. Right. The result, focusing on the results. Yeah. Focusing on how to live a better life. How to yeah. Live a life. Yeah. And one of the things that, <coughs> that emerged really quickly is this idea that um, we are like beasts that have to belong. And, mm-hmm. so that, you know, when you walk into a lot, of, you know, so where do you find belonging these days? It used to be at work, but a lot of people don't find it there. It used to be in faith based organizations. A lot of people are running from those places. Right. Local trade organizations and leagues a lot of those things are going away now. So a lot of people are walking around in like deep pain because we literally have to belong to survive. But the places we used to find that belonging are going away fast or they're just not providing it anymore. So I somehow understood early on that part of what we needed to do was solve for fitness, but part of what we need to do is solve for belonging, for connection. Mm. And so we built fierce communities. Um, and that alone was a game changer for people. And that's a lot of what I've still continued to sort of explore. I mean, it's like what you're doing with School of Greatness, yeah. right? You're not just, this isn't just a podcast. Right. I mean, you've got a global community here that's like profoundly connected. Yes. You know, and it's a huge part of why you've, you're just exploded because you're, you're building something bigger. Right. Now, how did you build community into um a fitness gym or a fitness studio. Yeah. So, I mean... Obviously, people are coming and going. Right. But... So, it, or like, on a couple of different levels. One, we really established, like, I focused on culture. I was like, what are we about? You know, like, this is what we believe. 
you know, and and so from the the most fundamental touch points, and it's like here's our guiding philosophy, and it's like community matters, people really matter. We're about cultivating relationships as much as we are about improving somebody's fitness or helping them lose weight or improve their you know cardiac risk you know disease. Uh, so so from there, then you start to build policies around it. So like mm-hmm. when somebody really simple example that makes a really big difference when we had the yoga center in new york city um at some point we started to you know computerize all the front desk stuff and we gained the ability to actually give everybody little little key tag swipes so they could swipe in and just like you know boom just use your swipe and go into class and nobody would have to talk to anybody at the front desk Mm -hmm. i literally ordered a box of those we didn't you know had the system set up and ready to go when they came i was like this is this is against (laughs) <laughs> what I stand Not for, talking because to people, yeah. what it's going to re- do, it's going to remove that one human touch point where somebody mm-hmm. says, you know, like, hey, Lewis, it's so awesome to see you again yeah. today. Can I check you into class? And most people think that's a tiny little thing, but it's actually huge because it makes somebody mm-hmm. feel like that, like they actually know me. Like they this care. is actually, yeah, this is a community. Like mm-hmm. I belong, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, it was interesting. So I know you're tuned into this because when we walked out last night to grab a, to grab a green drink, we walked out the door. And the guy who opened the door, you're like, hey, Carlos, what's up, man? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? You notice stuff like this and yeah, you yeah. care about it. Mm-hmm. You know? And the thing is, everybody does. But um, you're keyed into it in a way that I think I'll, the, the need to actually like identify and connect with people. Yeah. Most of us are disconnected from that. We just walk around in pain. And we don't understand that a big part of that pain is actually coming from the fact that we, we feel isolated, mm. even if we're surrounded by people. Yeah, especially more and more with social media. Yeah. And our phones and everything. Right. You know, <clears throat> I think the key to the success is relationships. You know, and the key to successful relationships is intimacy and being vulnerable or connecting yeah. with those people, not just saying I have a social media friend, but connecting. So yeah. I like that. And, you know, it's interesting that you remove that element, such a small thing that people would think that would be more convenient for people is actually... Right what pushes them away from you probably even more. Yeah. And it did like, it made the process less efficient. Yeah. No doubt yeah. about there's it. There's people backing up. There's what, yeah. You know. Yeah. No doubt about it. But at the same time, it made it more human. Uh-huh. And that's like, for me, it's like you choose your metrics, you know, was my metric going to be efficiency or was, was my metric going to be elevating community and humanity? Mm. You know, and I had, there was a clear answer, you know, it's like, um, I mean, recent conversation, probably a couple of years ago now with Seth Godin, who we both know. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we were talking about scaling. He's like, I got one metric, trust. All I care about is scaling trust. You know, it's like people focus on likes or money or this or right. that. He's like, I want to scale trust. Mm. You know, so it really, so much of it comes down to what are the metrics that we want to focus on and then build around it. For me, it was human connection. You know, that, yeah. that is just so important. That's cool. Well, in the book, you talk about three buckets to how to live a good life. What are the, what are the buckets? And connection is community. Your connection is one of them. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and and I want to just like create. There are so many. It's funny, like for me to write a book called How to like, Live a Good mm-hmm. Life. You know, except like, who am I? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it's like thousands of years of philosophers, <laughs> sure, and sure. great sages, and thinkers. So, and uh, what? But what I realize is is that you know all I have are my stories and my lens, mm-hmm. and. And and the question for me was, if we've known everything there is to know for thousands of years, why are we still not okay in the world? Why are we hurting? Yeah. So, and and, and I think a big part of it is because um, it's the models. It's the way that, that what we know is conveyed. It's not conveyed in a way which is like really simple, straightforward. You hear it once, you remember it. And the other thing is it's so simple that it's it's almost impossible not to act upon it. Like, it's got to be actionable in mm-hmm. somebody's lives who's a grown-up, who's busy. Like, you can't ask somebody to just constantly blow up their lives and walk away from everything. Because your average person in the middle years isn't going to do that. They would yeah. rather live the rest of their lives miserable than, than suffer the pain of blowing it up and starting over. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can certainly debates on both sides sure. of that. But that's just the truth on the ground. Right. So I wanted to just create a really simple model where somebody would hear it once. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. And they would understand every day how to do a little something. So that over time, it wasn't about big disruptive moves. It's like, there's a little something I can do today, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow. And then over a couple of weeks or months, you're kind of like, stuff is actually better. Right. And I didn't even really have to try it. So the idea of the buckets was, look, life is fundamentally about filling three buckets. Connection, we've talked about love and belonging. It's your relationship, right? Between other people, friends, lovers, family, colleagues, um, source, you know, if that's something mm-hmm. which is meaningful to you, the natural environment or the physical setting you're in. So that's connection is one bucket. 
The second bucket is vitality. It's the state of your mind and body. And to me, to actually try and explain those as two different things is just ludicrous. You know, mind and body are 100% one universal feedback mechanism. You can't work with one without affecting the other. Yeah. So it's optimizing around a lot of mind and body, which you know, like you kind of become a master at. Sure. Um, and then the third one is is what I call contribution, and that's really about how are you bringing your gifts to the world. You know, are are you are you moving into the world in a way where there's meaning and a sense of purpose, where you feel lit up, where you feel like you you know your strengths and your values and your beliefs, and you are a hundred percent stepping into them every day with what you do. And when you lay your head on the pillow at night, you're like. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that. I feel good <clears throat> yeah. about how I spent my time on the planet. Meaningful today. work. Yeah, yeah. Contributing and living in service. You know, one of the I think Tony Robbins said that the key to fulfillment is growth and contribution. Yeah. If you want to feel fulfilled, you need to be doing one of those two things, if not both of them. You yeah. need to be growing, learning. You know, in your own personal life, but then also serving other people. It could be your family, your community, the world. It could be anything, but you got to be in service in some way. Yeah, totally. And I think you also, like, you need to feel like you're being fully utilized. Yeah. You know, there's, we, we did a survey, I want to say it was like a year or two back now, and, and it was it kind of asking, I can't remember the exact question, it's like, um, do you feel like you're leveraging, like you, you're actually accessing your full potential? And we had a whole bunch of different things that were potential pain points for people. And the number one pain point was a feeling of, I know that I have so much more but I can't figure out how to close the gap between the potential that I'm leveraging every day and the potential that I know deep down I have. Like I can't figure out how to close that gap. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with self-ignorance, with just not knowing yourself well enough mm -hmm. to understand what matters to you. Like what do you actually know, believe matters in this world? You know, because you can't be intentional. You can't wake up in the morning and do what matters if you don't know yourself well enough mm -hmm. to understand what matters to you. You don't know yourself well enough to understand, like, what are your actual strengths? Like, what do you believe in the world? Mm -hmm. You know, so how can you decide to do more of that if you don't actually <coughs> know what it is? So how do you find out what you believe? And what if your beliefs change? When you learn new things, you're like, yeah. oh, what I thought I... I lived in this religion my whole life and I realized like that stuff is not what I believe anymore. Yeah, or certain totally. things, you know, my whole life's a lie now, you yeah. know, whatever, I don't know. Yeah, and and it's it's there there there's sort of like this interesting split, right? There are certain things which you probably consider more like on the level of a trait. It kind of is what it is. You know, it's like, you know, you're a tall dude. Uh -huh. You're going to be a tall dude your whole life. Yes. You know, you got a certain color of eyes. Um, but there are also certain, certain internal traits um and so it's th things like strengths, where there's been a ton of research and exploration around them, increasingly a lot of people would now argue in the research world that you kind of have, you know, your strengths. And there, you can definitely help build strengths, but they're relatively stable, you know, over the, the period of your life. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really important to understand them. And they're great short and fast assessments that you can use to actually figure that out these days. And then right. say, okay, I want to leverage these as much as I can, like when I'm out there doing my work in the world. Beliefs is the other thing. Those change, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I my belief system now is profoundly different than it was 10 years ago really? and 10 years before that. Like what I believe matters to me, what I believe is, you know, about what's possible and what's not possible is hugely different. You can change belief. You can snap beliefs. You can change them in a heartbeat. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing if our beliefs change every I think it's a great Five, thing. Five, ten years or whatever. I, I think it's an awesome thing. I think I think the moment that you lock yourself into certainty about your beliefs is the moment that you stop growing. Is the moment where you, Milton Glaser, had this amazing conversation with who's one, you know, the most iconic living designer. And at one point, I mean, he has designed some of the most incredible things on the planet. You may not know his name, but you know something that he's created. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, like, certainty is a closing of the mind. The moment you are certain, the moment, like, you lock down the possibility that something might be different or you might believe differently in the future is the moment that you stop asking questions. It's the moment where curiosity ends. It's the moment where, where un the uncertainty that's necessary for possibility to emerge in your life vanishes. Because if you're certain about something, then you stop exploring anything beyond that, right? And, and the moment you stop exploring, there's no possibility in your life mm. anymore. Your life starts going sideways. Man, I don't know about you or like your listeners. I'm pretty sure about you and pretty sure probably about your listeners too, but I'm not here to go sideways. Yeah. You know? What if your beliefs are already pretty solid? <clears throat> what if you're like, <clears throat> yeah. You've got really solid beliefs. Yeah. 
it it's so part of what why change them you know if already you're living a good life with these beliefs well so but that's the second part of the, of like what you were just saying is the really thing right so if you are an, indeed living a good life with your beliefs no reason to change them mm. right but the question you got to ask is like when somebody's like, well, this is what I believe. I believe and I'm pretty sure I'm right and it's all good and it's given me the life that I have. You know, the next question is, well, how's that working for you? Right. Like, are you actually sitting here <clears throat> living a good life? You know, like, do right. you have these beautiful, deep and enduring relationships? Are you doing meaningful work where you feel like you're fully leveraging, utilizing mm -hmm. the world? Are you connected to source and people? Or is your body, like, are you vibrant? Like, are you radiating health? You know, because if somebody says, I'm locked into my beliefs and they're good, they're viable, solid beliefs, and that's how I live my life according to those beliefs. And you can point to major, you know, places in their lives that are relatively disastrous. Right. Something's got, something's not working. Yeah. You know, so part of the process, I think sometimes with, with if you have that conversation with somebody is literally ask them, you know, to, not from like an arrogant little, how's that working standpoint, but just like, how's that actually working for you? Like that's, that's cool. Like if you have these beliefs and they've been with you for life and you feel like you're actually really living the life that you're, you want to live and you're meant to live, go for it. Right. Keep them. Right. But if you're not, something's got to change. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, it's like I say in the book, like I'm, I'm not asking for anybody to buy into anything. You know, the only thing that I ask anybody for is to be open to the possibility that there might be another story, another truth. You know, something else that they can do out there that mm -hmm. might allow them to be better in the world. Yeah. You know, and then try it. And I'm not a huge fan of just like leaning into what anybody tells you on pure faith. It's sure. Like, run an experiment. Try. Yeah, yeah. You course. know, let your personal experience tell you whether your belief is still valid or whether something's got to change. Right. Yeah. Um, you talk about how to fill the buckets up, right? Yeah. You go through each chapter on how to fill them up. What is, how does someone fill up the, the connection and the community bucket right now with just this overwhelming amount of, I need to generate more following on social mm -hmm. media and constantly on their phones. How does someone get away from that when it's the source of their business? Yeah. Is, it, is it's so digital connection, right? you know? Yeah. It, it's such an interesting question. We're moving from just hanging out like this, like mm -hmm. we are now to always having a screen between us mm -hmm. nonstop, you know, and, on the one hand, it's not a bad thing because a lot of really great relationships can start absolutely digitally have. for me too. Yeah, yeah, you know, and but but the relationship never really happens to me on the level that mm -hmm. it can happen until I'm in a room with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, even if it continues almost entirely digitally after that, it's different. If I've actually spent yes. some time face absolutely. to face, part of what happens when you put a screen in front of somebody is that and there's really interesting research that's been done. Um, Sherry Turkle out of MIT and some other people is that um, it removes empathy from the conversation, you know? And so we stop actually having empathy with somebody else. You know, it sort of, it creates a level of not just anonymity, but like, um, so a lot of conversation happens in the digital space and it's what they call asynchronous, meaning it's not just, you know, like we're not just talking and like it's, we can look at each other and the conversation happens in real time. It's like you get a text or somebody snaps or whatever it is and you got to respond to it. And you're thinking, like, you actually take a couple of seconds to think about how am I going to formulate, like, what should I say, right? Mm. And when you do that, you're always going to present sort of a cleaner, better right, version. version of yourself when you do that. And the problem is it removes those moments of real-time vulnerability. Mm. And, like, those, like, those just mini snapshots of vulnerability of, like, your dorkiness or geekiness or whatever it is that really makes you you, when those leave the conversation, that those are the most profound. Those are, like... Those are the moments where, where you connect on a level that blows apart like the shiny, happy self that you tend to show other people mm -hmm. when there's a screen in between them. You know, um, what's kind of interesting about Snapchat to me is that it's almost become a, 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 like a step back into that place of like being totally vulnerable. I think yeah. maybe because a lot of people know it goes away, right? right? So when I look at, you know, like the way that my daughter uses Snapchat, like her and yeah. her friends, like... They're, you know, like sharing all sorts of like crazy, silly, like dopey pictures, like yeah, yeah. hyper vulnerable. Yeah, bad angles, all the time. Like whatever, yeah. Right. And, and that's kind of like become the ethos yeah. on that particular platform. Whereas, but almost every other one, it's all, it's almost the always. Reel. Yeah, the exactly. Reel. Yeah. Exactly. And that kind of kills your ability to connect on that deeper level where it's like, oh, I'm struggling today, man. Or I'm a, a bit of a weirdo. Or mm -hmm. I'm different than you in this way. Or like, I just made a mistake, you know. 
those are the moments where the most profound relationships take root, you know, even on a personal level, mm-hmm. you know, like one-to-one with a partner in life, you know, if the conversation always stays at the level, it's like, well, tell me about the good stuff that happened to you today. Right. <laughs> You know, and, and and tell me about the bad stuff too, but tell me how, you know, tell me in a good way. Yeah, right. Right. Don't, I don't want any of the mess. Mm-hmm. That's not a relationship. Yeah. You know, so when you allow for that stuff to happen, that's where the really juicy stuff happens. And, um, and so much, so often technology takes a lot of that away or just enough of it away that it strips away what's really awesome yeah. about the relationship. Um, and, and there's an argument to me also that it, it deludes you into thinking that you actually are connecting with a lot of people and stops you from then going out and having those real face-to-face or deeper conversations mm-hmm. that make a real difference. Um, but So I'm not like anti-technology. I mean, we're sitting here right now and there's a lot, a lot yeah, of technology yeah. happening between us. Yep. Uh, but I think it has its place. And very often its place is to find people who you think would be really well aligned with you, mm-hmm. start a conversation, and then as soon as you can, like take it real time. Yeah, because um, that's where the magic really happens, and and, and the flip side is also you know, we talked about individual connection, but also community. You know, building, being part of something bigger than you, where you feel like there's shared values and beliefs and aspirations, is really important to us. Um, so and how, how can people find that? Is it yeah, through their hobbies, through yeah. I mean, for like again, it, it, this goes back to first you got to do a little bit of work to know yourself, mm, right? <laughs> you know, right. and that's why you know you have so many freshmen show up in college. And they join everything in the right, planet right. and they come home at the end of the freshman year and they're, they feel alone and isolated. Right. Uh-huh. And it's not because they haven't tried and they're not, they're surrounded by people all day, every day. Right. It's because they actually never just hit pause long enough to do a little bit of work, to learn about themselves enough to actually know, well, this is what needs to be in place. Like I want to join a club where, you know, like everybody's, you know, like there's, their, their social wiring is a little bit quieter. You know, and they want to, you know, they're kind of into art and they really dig nature and um, they have deep philosophical conversations rather than I want to join you know, like a fraternity where it's all about partying, people like really extroverted and social. Not that mm-hmm. that's every fraternity, but, right. you know, to know which of those things is right for you, you got to know yourself first. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just, we don't do that work. And it's actually not, um, to just get at least a baseline level of knowledge about like who we are and what we care about doesn't take that much work. Right. It just takes a willingness to go a little bit deeper into ourselves before we try and actually go out into the world and find like involve ourselves with relationships and communities that actually resonate with who we really are rather than the facade of who we think we should be. Mm-hmm. How do we find ourselves? What's, yeah. what's like? Uh, asking questions. Um, you know, there are, there are a set of baseline assessments that we've used in different programs that we've run and stuff like that. Like uh, we've used for st- you know, strengths, for example. Yeah. You know, there are two big assessments. One, the Strengths Finder, yeah. which a lot of people know. It's probably a lesser known one called the VIA um, Strengths Assessment. And that, that actually is really heavily researched and came out of the world of positive psychology. Mm-hmm. And so both of these things generally, they'll give you, you take a questionnaire, take a, take it takes 20 minutes, yeah, yeah. right? And they'll <clears> give you a list of like 20 to 25 strengths. And your top five are generally the ones which really are the heartbeat of the things. And, but they're different also. Like the via strengths is more about your, your virtues, you know, and whereas strengths finder would probably be more apt to describe them more along the lines of like your talents or your gifts. But either way, the idea is once you have a sense of these things, like can you move through your day? in a way where you're leveraging them as much as you possibly can. Because when you build your life around your ability to leverage those things, rather than spend all of your time trying to fix what's wrong, mm-hmm. a lot of what's wrong starts to drop away. Yeah. And you feel like really empowered. Same thing when it comes to you know, like your values and beliefs. You start asking questions. Like The most fundamental question, like the question you start with is, what's important to me? You know, and then your first line answer is going to be something like, well, family or money or power or, right. you know, cars, whatever it may be. You know, and a lot of people stop there. Like, let me just, what are my top five there? And that's going to give you really shallow answers, which is going to give you really shallow life. You know, so then you ask the next question. You essentially keep asking that question. Well, of these things, like, why are they important? Mm-hmm. You know, and then why are they important? You keep asking the why question until you get down to like a deeper emotional level of why these things matter. So it's not hard, but sometimes it's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we don't do the work. You know, I know over the last few years, and like we've been friends for a while now, mm-hmm. 
you've gone deep real deep on a personal yeah, yeah. level you know mm-hmm. like the, to see what you've gone like to see the depth that you've like learned yourself mm-hmm. it's kind of stunning mm-hmm. and so much of the of the shift that you've made in your professional life and your personal life over the last three years you know have been an outgrowth of just a deep process of self-discovery right. really knowing yourself on a level that when we first met like your level of self-knowledge and the way you bring yourself to the world is so different mm. you know it's like it's palpable and i think people feel that they yeah. respond to it yeah you know the funny thing is i feel like i'm just getting started you know yeah totally it's like oh man there's so much more to discover you know yeah when well, i feel like i figured something out it's like no you haven't figured anything out right <laughs> you know? right you always hit that threshold you're like i think i have it dialed in like the next step is like i know nothing i know it's the worst completely <laughs> ignorant <laughs> it's, it's like good though to keep questioning your beliefs and values and make sure that you're doing what works for you and the world yeah you know? and it's like it goes back to what we were talking about earlier you know like is is to be open you know and and i look at things like this as okay this is my snapshot this is a moment in time right now right this is what i think i know and understand mm-hmm. about myself and about the world and the way that i that i move into it um but I'm going to keep asking questions. I'm going to keep running experiments. I look at, you know, so my current company, you know, we've been around for four years now. Mm-hmm. And we're growing nicely. But built into the name of the company is the word project. You know, because to me, it's a series of experiments. This is a project for me. You know, and, and I wonder if we looked at building a good life as just a project with a series of experiments. You know, like that would give us so much more freedom to allow ourselves to be open to whatever the experiments yield rather than saying like this has to succeed now in this window of time. It's like, no, I'm going to run an experiment. You know, my, my goal is to actually just learn, mm-hmm. you know, and this may give me the answer that I really want, which would be awesome. Yeah. May give me an answer that I'm not all that comfortable with. Right. But then the question is, so what do I do with that? Right. You know, and then how do I actually run the next experiment and then the next? I'm I'm such a huge fan of experiments or games, whatever you want to call them for no. me. I feel like that's the way I learn is by taking on a challenge. Okay, for this week, for this month, I'm going to do something every single day to see what works, what didn't work, or what I learned from it. And I feel like, and I usually do it around things I'm most afraid of. Yeah. Things I'm most afraid of. Like what's an I, example? Of, like, what's like when I was a teenager, it was like I was terrified to talk to girls. Yeah. So every day I was like, anytime I get butterflies when I see a girl that I like, I have to go up and talk to her. Right. Like that's my challenge. That's my game for the day, and uh, and just say hello and see where the conversation goes. It was right. like terrifying. Another one was public speaking. I was terrified of speaking public, so I said, okay, every week I'm going to go to a public speaking class for mm. a year. And I did that, and I was able to see so much growth over the year. It was yeah. terrifying. It was horrible. It was, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of pain and suffering. But I see where I'm at now, like eight, nine years later from when I started that challenge. Like I'm able to really be in front of people and make an impact. You know, still a lot more right. to go, still a lot farther to grow. But if I didn't take on that experiment or that challenge of that project years ago, then I wouldn't be here. Yeah. And so I constantly take on challenges, projects, games, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I feel like that's the juice. It's like we learn. That's like my master's program, you know? Yeah. It's when we take on those projects. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, the moment that you decide that you're done, that you're good, you got it all figured out, to me, is the moment that you start living. Uh, stop living. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the moment that, like we yeah. said, that's the moment that growth ends. You know, and at some point you'd love to be like, I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> the quote that I throw around. It's part of like our Good Life Project Living Creed. It's right towards the end, which is a good life is not a place at which you arise. It's a lens through which you see and create your world. You know, and so many of us are like, they're like when I get there, then I'm going to be living that good right, life. Right, right. right? It's like when I get this, I'm going to be living that good life. Yeah. And like, I just need this much money in the bank or this house or this relationship or this power job. Mm-hmm. And, and then they get there and they're like, you know, just a little bit more, you know, that's yeah. the answer is just, and there's actually really fascinating research around this that's been done where people, you know, they'll ask, well, how much do you need to feel like, you know, like you're, you're good in life, mm-hmm. you know? And they say, well, and then a they, million dollars. Or right. Whatever. And then they'll track people like, you know, like when they actually hit that number. And then they're not good? Never. Literally never. You know, then the, the, the amount is always a little more. bit further down the road. Why is that? It's, I think it's just the way that we're wired. We're constant, we're wired for more. You know, we're wired for discontent to a certain extent. And Why? It's, it's really interesting. Um, I think part of it is just societally. You know, like mm. we're taught that these particular things matter. You know, like these, there, there's a set of metrics that, that tell you when you've made it, when you're actually living that good life. 
you know, and it's kind of predefined by culture. You know, so what's interesting is that if you actually look at the American culture or Western culture in general, it's pretty universal, right? It's a certain amount of money. It's mm-hmm. a job that makes a certain amount of money, has a certain amount of prestige, a certain amount of cars in the garage, you know, a house of a certain size or an apartment of a certain size, you know, like it's all these standardized things, which basically are checkpoints that say, okay, now you're living that good life. But when you actually leave Western culture and you go into more Eastern based cultures, the metrics change pretty profoundly. Even Western culture that's European versus American, you know, the emphasis on family, family, community in Europe or South America, Central travel. America, totally different. Yeah. You know, it's so much less about what we have or how much we're making. I mean, if you go to Ireland and you're know, like the first question out of your mouth is, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> People are like, what's wrong with you? Right. You know, it's like they care about like, who are you as a human? They care. They're actually more interested in like, you know, who is your family? Um, and so there's, there's just become this really strong emphasis on what you have as the metric for living a good life in the U.S. And even in Western countries where it's not the U.S. based, it shifts pretty quickly to how deep are your relationships? How much time do you spend with people that you love that you can't get enough of? Then when you go even farther east, it's how much stillness do you have in your life? You know, it's how, how at peace are you? You know, do you lay your head down? At the end of the day, feeling like you've done meaningful work, Mm -hmm. you've been of service, and you're at peace. You know, so if we actually started to exalt those as metrics that really define a life well lived, man, so many of us would then start to realize, oh, I could actually have that right now. Yeah, I don't need to chase something. Yeah, yeah. like I could be living this now. It's just a matter of like, I want to wear a different lens, Mm -hmm. you know, now. And it, it relieves so much pain because we don't have to feel like we're just this is all about suffering until I quote, make it. It's like, no, you know, like maybe circumstances aren't exactly as I need them to be now, but there's a whole lot of good right now too. And if I shift the metrics of what it means to actually be living that awesome life, there's so much, which I can either just see right, right here now that I don't see or create in the moment, you know, because I have control over my choice. Mm -hmm. Like I can move from being massively reactive and maniacally busy doing things that are generally um, not all that meaningful to me and set by somebody else's agenda, right? So I, I rest my head on my pillow at the end of the day, being frazzled, stressed, no peace at all, yeah. wiped out. And when you ask me how my day was, I'll tell you busy. And you'll ask, you know, ask well, like, <laughs> what did you do that mattered? And you'd be like, I really don't know. Mm. Versus saying, okay, I'm going to wake up in the morning. And the first thing I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes in stillness to just like you know, get into myself and then ask myself, all right, what's the single most meaningful thing that I, the one single most meaningful thing that I could do today? You know, like, let me do that. Everything, anything else that happens beyond that. Awesome. Bonus. Bonus, Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, so check as many boxes as you want after that, you know, and ask, you know, and you wake up in the morning and this is like a morning bucket check, right? Really quick scan. You know, like how, how full is my vitality bucket today? You know, zero to 10. It's about a seven. Right? How full is my connection bucket today? Yeah, it's it's an eight. Like I feel like I'm I'm doing really good. I'm in loving relationships. I'm like, I've been talking to my friends and hanging out mm-hmm. with them. You know, how full is my my contribution bucket? I don't feel like I've been doing stuff that's really mattering to me or like my strengths. I just don't feel like I'm really leveraging myself all that fully. It's just kind of low, right? So I'm probably gonna say, okay, so today I want to f- focus on doing a little something to fill that contribution bucket. I want to really figure out, okay, what can I do today that's really gonna make me feel like I'm standing in my strengths. You know, and you just like, you don't have to make the whole day maniacally about this. Just like, what's one little action I can take that'll fill that bucket a little bit. And like, you can rest your head at the pillow, you know, on your pillow at the end of the day saying, yeah, like, Mm -hmm. okay, A, I chose instead of just responding to other people's agendas. So right away, it's a win, Mm -hmm. right? You, there's, there's something I call reactive life syndrome, right? Which is basically we go through life, you're being dominated by other people's agendas and being maniacally busy with stuff that doesn't matter to us. Mm-hmm. You like the minute you choose, then that goes out the window because you move from being reactive to intentional, right? And that's where life really starts mm-hmm. to light up. Where do you think our suffering comes from? Uh, life. <laughs> I think so much of it comes from um, expectations, expectations about about what we should have, who we should be, um, what life is supposed to be like. Uh, I think part of it is also, so part of it is expectations that have us chasing 
things that we think really matter mm. that don't. Um, you know, there's a, and so part of it is that part of it is that we are also, most of us are soft wired to seek security slash, which is also just another word for certainty. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's only one thing in life that I am absolutely certain about. And that is that we can never have certainty, right? So, so there's literally no conceivable way. There's nothing that we can do today or for the rest of our lives to lock down a certain future, mm. a certain minute, a certain moment, right? 9-11 for me was a huge wake up call, Yeah, you know? Um, <clears throat> so by definition, if we invest the vast majority of our waking hours in trying to pursue something that's impossible to attain for our entire lives, that's suffering, mm. you know, rather than saying, listen, I don't know what the future holds. I, I, I'm going to lock it down as much as I can. You know, I'm I have a vision. I want to have some money in the bank yeah, so yeah. my family's taken care of. You know, like, yes. oh. But fundamentally, I'm also going to acknowledge the fact that, to a large extent, it's unlockdownable. I'm going to work really hard to do great work and do good things in the world. But at the same time, I know at the end <clears> of the day, life's uncertain. Yeah, I think I learned that early on when I was 23 or 24. You know, I had a dream to play in the NFL when yeah, I got injured. Right. And I was like, my whole life was changed because there was no other option. This was like, this is happening. I'm going to make it happen. But when I wasn't open to, okay, well, things change or things are uncertain or things, you know, maybe there's a different path for me. Like I wasn't even open to it. And so there was like this suffering and this pain and depression for a year and a half, two years because I was just like, what do I do now? Yeah. What, so I'm curious what, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've talked about this, right? Probably a bunch of times. <clears throat> I don't think I've ever asked you like, what what snapped you out of it? Like, what took you from a place of mm. like laying on your sister's couch to back to a place of curiosity and possibility? I, th- I think, uh, you know, my my dad had gone through a, a really bad accident at the same time, a head trauma, and he was in a coma for a few months. And he wasn't able to really, he's still alive, but he hasn't been able to fully kind of recover to mm. the dad that I knew. Uh, emotionally, spiritually, he's just had a head trauma. And uh, it's, you know, so it's been hard for him to get back. And I remember taking care of him. We like had to teach him how to write and how to talk again and how to like, just do normal functional things, remember certain things. And uh, I remember being like, wow, okay. Like I don't have my dad to like just have my back or to uh-huh. like go to mentor me to kind of lean back on. He was always like my safety net. Yeah. He was always like, go live your dream and then come work for me, you know. Go do your thing, and then when you're ready, when you're done with that, like I've got a spot for you, right. type of thing. So I never had to like figure it out on my own. He was always there to support me. And after a couple of years, I'm on my sister's couch. I was like, oh, my dad's not going to be able to support me. I'm, I'm not going to be able to like have him anymore as a mm-hmm. safety net. I was like, well, I can either continue living like this and feel like a worthless piece of crap on my sister's couch, yeah. adding no value to the world, or I can figure out what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And um, that's when I started taking on these challenges. I was like, okay, well, yeah. I want to make an impact. I need to learn how to speak and communicate because right. I was just a big dumb jock, you know? <laughs> I mean, I had a big heart and I could connect with people, but I didn't know right. how to deliver and package my message in a way that people were able to receive it. Mm. And so I started doing public speaking and then learning about online marketing because I was like, I just need to make money. And I was just like, okay, I'm discovery mode now and I'm going to try everything. Uh. And... um I think that's what it was. I just made a decision after a couple of years. I was like, okay, I'm going to be something. I'm yeah. going gonna, I'm gonna to make something of my life. I'm going to make an impact. I'm going to make a difference. You know, I'm going to show people that I matter and, um, and do something with my life. So yeah. that's it's just time and uh, awareness and awakening. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's what happens with so many people too. It's sort of like you're, like you're wallowing and wallowing and wallowing. Yeah. And like you hit a point where you just like, look, <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and it, tired. It, right. right. It's like if I don't make a different choice now, this is going to be my life. That's it. And I'm not liking the trajectory yeah. that this is taking. It's sort of like this is this is one of the things that made me leave the law like way back mm-hmm. in the day. I was like I was I was coming up on thirty years old, you know, and I'm like, if I don't do this now, it's gonna be another twenty years yeah. before I make this decision. And even though I wasn't comfortable doing it and Because you're making like, good money, you've got yeah, security. Like yeah. I had the the job that everybody wanted. You know, and I was like, but if I don't do this now, I literally, it's going to be a couple of decades before I'm going to be back in this place where I'm going to be willing to actually extract myself from the yeah. pain that I'm feeling now. Yeah. Um, so I'm always, I'm always so curious, like what those inciting incidents yeah. are for people. Um, I think I also had nothing to lose. I didn't have a job. Uh, I didn't have a family. I didn't have right. these things. So I was like, 
let me just go see what I can create yeah. since I'm already at the bottom, you know? Um, yeah, it was interesting. It was definitely an interesting time, but yeah. it's like, you With gotta your, build momentum, you know, it's like, I yeah. had nothing and I just had to build momentum. It takes a while. So, so here I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm taking over the interview, it's okay. it's okay. <laughs> it's like, but I'm really curious because we've never talked about this. So like, part of, part of the reason I wrote this, like when it mm. really comes down to it is because I, I would love for this book to go out into the world and be the inciting incident that that inspires somebody to say, wait, let me think about things differently. Like yes. Maybe like this is a moment where I don't have to blow things up. Right. I can actually start. I'm curious, with, with School of Greatness, when mm-hmm. you wrote the book, was that in your mind at all too as like one of the reasons for the book? To be like... Um, to sort of like be this like thing that kind of like yeah, sparks catalyst. somebody. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, when I read 4-Hour Workweek, that was like the catalyst for me to start working and everything I was doing yeah. eight years ago. And I was like, I want to create a piece of work that opens people up to possibilities, yeah. to what's possible in their life, and to like start moving forward towards that life that they want. And uh, absolutely. So that's great. I mean, I, <clears throat> I like also, you have a, a thing about nature in here too. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, you totally. have all these different <laughs> challenges, you know, a 30-day challenge here about how to you know fill up your buckets which i think is extremely important because playing games having challenges having a project whatever you want to call it is something i think we should always be doing and uh, i think you give some great examples of how to take it on so we don't have to think of our own challenge yeah and that was the whole idea i was like you know i could i'm a writer fundamentally so i love i just the craft of writing i love i love Mm. actually like obsessing over sentences and stuff like that (laughs) so i'm a weirdo like that um but fundamentally, also, I want to write something that was, you know, I'm in the middle of my life. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I have, my days are full, yeah. you know, and, and I have a lot of friends that are in the same position. And I want to, to create something that was actionable for somebody that already had a full life and where they could just, like, they could, there was something to do every day where they could just flip it open. I mean, literally, you can, you can read this not linearly. You mm-hmm. can pick a chapter. Anywhere, it's yeah. a day. Say, like, this is something I'm going to do today. You know, it's short. It's sweet. But it makes a difference, and a lot of the stuff is also all scientifically validated. You right. know, there's, there's research behind it. Um, but the, you brought up the tree thing, which is, which is something that I've known intuitively for for life. Is that like my reset is nature. Yeah, it's either the woods or the beach. Um, for me, I grew up the beach was the end of my road, so the water for me is really mm. like where I touch stone. But also, I mean, there's something about being in nature, especially walking in the woods, which is just like profoundly calming. It's a major reset for me. So I got really curious. It turns out there's that there's, there's a ton of research on how nature literally you know it changes our physiology mm. um, and our mindset and our you know the chemicals that are coursing through us. Um, there there is actually there's a Japanese word shinrin yoku, which translates to forest bathing, and there are shinrin yoku designated forests in Japan, where they wow. literally designated where you know you can go into them, and just walking in these forests leave it will literally change your life. Um, but you know, not all of us have forests, right? Mm-hmm. So the research also shows that simply being in an office or being at home during the day and being in a setting where you have a plant in view that you can see versus having no greenery at all, even that tiny thing makes a really big difference. Interesting. Yeah. So have plants or it's crazy. <laughs> something in your office or in right. your house. So it's like as simple as you know, like you go out for a walk where there, you know, you're you're around a whole bunch of greenery. But even if you can and you're in yeah. your home or work setting put something green in it and it actually makes a difference like I, little things i believe that i mean just imagine yourself in a box all day you know with no life in there nah. it's hard to feel alive i guess when you're in the box constantly without life but when you put life in there then yeah you know you're connected in a different way yeah i mean there's even there, there are studies done on um hospital patients um ones where you're in a room where there's you can't see out the window w- with trees and others where there's actually a window with trees the recovery rates are faster. No they experience way. less pain, and they're discharged more quickly from the oh, hospital. That's crazy. When you have a window where you can see like nature outside, that's of it. crazy. It's amazing. I think it's all. I mean, that's. It seems. I mean, it seems true because it's like if you can see possibility of growth, and if you can see like yeah, yeah. something that's alive, you probably feel more inspired to get out. I don't know, but yeah. as opposed to just seeing a brick wall. In, yeah, in New York City, you know, across the street from your window or something. Right, whatever it is, it just it makes a difference. Yeah, <laughs> that's all I know. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. What's missing in your life right now? Um, space. Um, two things: space, uh, but that's a deliberate choice right now, mm-hmm. and working with my hands. Um, so for me, you know, I've 
whenever you're bringing something to life, which is a big project you worked on for years, things get compressed yes. and your days get, get busy. Um, and I hate that word busy, but, but it, you know, the saving grace for me, and I think it's really important for anybody is that it's okay to fill your day with a lot of stuff, but do it deliberately. Don't just take it by default. Don't let like other people's stuff pile into your day to fill it up. Fill your day with stuff that you've chosen matters to you. So right now, like uh, there's not a ton of space in my days because mm-hmm. um, I'm bringing something that I care deeply about to the world. So they're filled as I like bring it out there, but I'm choosing, you know, this is, so I'm choosing what I'm going to do. I'm choosing what matters, why it matters. And I'm choosing to be in this place for a certain window of time where I know I'll then step back out of it. Yeah. And at the same time, I still have a daily practice, you know, which keeps me, my mindset still and allows me to still optimize and fill my vitality mm-hmm. bucket. And if that starts to get messed up, I'll pull back. Um, the other thing is working with my hands. I, uh, there's something like that. I don't know if you feel this way too, but I grew mm-hmm. up as a kid working with my hands and I was an artist also. And then I built houses in the summers during college. Mm-hmm. And there's something about creating where like you're physically using your hands to make something. And then at the end of it, you can step back and just like see it and touch it and yeah. feel it and be like, I made that. That's cool. And I haven't been, I've been creating a lot, but in the digital space over the last couple of years. It's not the same. And I'm feeling this itch mm. to actually dive in and just work with my hands more. Mm. What would you make? A guitar. Mm. For some reason, <laughs> I've been talking about this that. for years. Um, mm. and, and, uh, and, and so part of it is like, that's going to be actually kind of like probably one of my rewards. After um, the book comes out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, it's uh, gonna, to learn to actually you, do that. You haven't done it before. No. I haven't. You know, you can, you can go to these you know, programs, basically and classes, go, schools, yeah. dive intensively. I've had a friend yeah. do that too. Yeah. 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 Um, you go for like a week or two and you like make a guitar, right? Yeah, exactly. Crazy. But even just little things like work with my hands, like I've started, like I'll start painting a little bit again mm-hmm. and just to feel like I'm making stuff with my hands um, mm, and making cool. art. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I feel like I don't have that itch, but I have the itch to create art through sports. Yeah, yeah. to play, to use my, to use my yeah. hand to like throw a ball, to catch, to like touch people, like be messy on in sports and playing basketball. It's like I, that's my itch. You know? Yeah, but um, and maybe because I'm just not that talented at the artist stuff yet. Maybe it's not someday. even that. It's it's that that is your artistry. Right, right. You know, is, your yeah. canvas is is athletics, is yeah. sports, is movement. For me, it's beautiful. It's, yeah, it's you know, I feel like. No, I've seen you. I've seen like footage of you in like, right. various <laughs> different settings. I'm like, that is mastery. Right, like, that, yeah. is, that is artistry. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what are you grateful for in your life? Uh, my family. Like, I mean, I'm grateful for so much. My God, there's like almost nothing that I could say I'm not grateful mm-hmm. for. But the thing that comes to me first and foremost, my family. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, my wife is just one of the most amazing people on the planet, and my kid is, you know, an awesome human being who's yeah, growing cool. into a really just a, a you know. She's a good, awesome. A good person. Yeah. Um, who cares about the world. And uh, um, yeah, and, and my wife is also my business partner too. So mm-hmm. we literally work together and live together and breathe together 24-7. Um, and we're married almost 20 years now. Wow. How do you um, navigate that when you're married and working yeah, together? Yeah, it's so funny. People are like, you guys should do some sort of program or workshop <laughs> on like building a life and building a business together. And we're like, honestly, we don't we we don't know how it works <laughs> yeah. you know it just does we have different skill we i think a big part of it is we're really fortunate in over a period of a you know long time together we've grown as individuals in a way where we're still deeply complementary to each other mm-hmm. you know and sometimes honoring your own personal path has people growing away from um the way that they they need to be to stay together mm. and and that's a tough thing but it's also an okay thing wait say that again honoring your own personal path what you know i think so it's really important to to honor your own personal growth to grow into the person that you know like to become fully expressed as who you are as an individual in the world you know and when we're in relationship with other people whether it's a partner or friends mm-hmm. or even business partners you know, if each one of us are like doing what we need to do to become who we need to be individually, we change, we evolve. And over a period of years or decades, sometimes you change and evolve in a way where you're still deeply connected and complementary and the relationship still is profoundly beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you evolve in a way individually where you're not as complimentary anymore. You know, it doesn't mesh nearly as well anymore. Maybe it's a business partner. It's time to, you know, grow apart. Maybe it's a partner in life. Um, And so part of, you know, a part of it, I think, is work. A part of it is all the classic stuff for relationships. Part of it is also, you know, honoring who we need to become individually Mm -hmm. 
and there's a certain amount of of just luck in that still being the person mm. who's still deeply complimentary and you're know, like we're we're blessed yeah. in that we've both grown individually in a lot of ways in a way where we're both like just so profoundly still in love with each other um and love working together that's amazing you know and co-creating stuff together and building community and um and we also just on a practical level like from a business standpoint we do different things yeah yeah and we have different mo's and we're good at different things so So it works it works in both areas it's not for everybody (laughs) yeah that's crazy yeah yeah i mean we're growing so much i feel like so many people are growing apart and in relationships as uh, well, right? Marriages, it's like more and more divorce. Uh, do you think it's because people are growing into who they truly are more and more, or do you think it's more of a cop out or they're just not working enough? Yeah. I um, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, everyone's it, different, huh? Yeah. Although it, here's a really interesting, um, bit of data and I, I haven't validated this, but I've sort of actually been told it recently, uh, is that, arranged marriages actually have a higher success rate than what I would call Mm -hmm. sort of like a natural love-based marriage. And I don't, there's, there may be all sorts of societal constructs that make that not healthy or healthier. I don't really know, but it's kind of like that. When I heard that, it stopped me. I was like, huh, what's really going on there? But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I don't have an answer to that, but, um, I just, it's crazy. This life, knock on wood every day, consider myself blessed and grateful. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. Congrats on that. Um, this is called the three truths, three truths question. Cool. So it's your last day, many years from now, mm. all your work has been erased from time yeah. and you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down three things you know to be true about everything you've created in your life that you would then pass on to your family, friends and the world. Mm. What would be your three truths? Uh, lead with love. Uh, meaning matters and embrace the unknown. I like those. Mm. They're solid. <laughs> uh, two final questions. Uh, but before I do, I want to make sure everyone, before I ask them, I want to make sure everyone gets the book, How to Live a Good Life by Jonathan Fields, Soulful Stories, Surprising Science, and Practical Wisdom. Make sure to pick it up right now. And um, in on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, there'll also be a link on the show notes on how to get this. So go pick up a copy um, and let Jonathan know what you think. Um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Jonathan, for your incredible friendship to me and your incredible grace. I look at you as such an incredible, as a graceful human being. Uh, thank you. And that grace for me is like is like guidance. You're like this guiding individual human being that really leads with soul. And for me, it's something that I really appreciate because, you know, you helped me with so many things and when I was going through a lot of discovery in myself, I turned to you for guidance and grace. So I want to acknowledge you for what you've created in the world and how you've shown up for me to be willing to, you know, bear my soul to you and, and talk about things that, that happened to me and really reveal it on the podcast a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, that, that episode that we did together brought so much healing for not only me, but so many people in the world. So I want to acknowledge you for your continual showing up, giving, leading with love, and um, being so graceful. Uh, thank you, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. Of course, yeah. And the final question is, what's your definition of greatness? Mm. Um, yeah, it's like it's probably evolving for me. Um, owning the, f- doing the work to really understand who you are what matters to you in the world um, and how you need to express yourself and then um, aligning the actions, aligning the way that you live every day with the truth of who you are in a way where you close the gap between that person and the person you bring to the world. Hmm. John of the Fields. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate it, brother. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking right here to subscribe because each week we come out with awesome, epic and inspiring interviews and messages and videos just for you. So click subscribe right here 
to get notified of new videos every week. Also, if you enjoyed this specific interview, we've got a lot of great interviews like this that are uplifting and inspiring. So click right here to watch the previous interviews because the people I've had on are pretty cool and epic as well. So click here to watch previous interviews. Click here to subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll see you very soon.